On this side we have the iconic kangaroos and cockatoos of Australia. And in between we have this messed up slice of bits of crust that have basically come up out of the ocean as Australia has shifted, has, has moved up and bumped into Asia. And that have never really been properly connected to anywhere. And in that part you get all sorts of weird stuff. You get sort of the gigantism you might expect of island biogeography. You get things like Bobby Rusa that thinks it's a great idea to have tusks coming straight out of the top of its head. And now I'd just like to add humans as well because obviously humans arrived in Australia about 50,000 years ago. They didn't um, they didn't come via Antarctica, they had to come via this part of the world. And also this part of the world has a very long history of association with hominids. So Homo erectus, I think 1. Million, 1. 1.8 million years or thereabouts in Java. Here, this is the near, near skull, this is not the near skull, this is the <laughs> near skull and a slightly younger other skull. Uh, from near Great Cave, this is the oldest dated Homo sapiens sapiens remains in this part of the world. And then in the last few years, up pops another island biogeography classic, potentially the dwarfed Homo floresiensis, a new, new species. And I was involved in dating both, both of these sites. And the reason I was involved in doing this was because I spent a lot of the 1990s trying to figure out when people arrived here. And to do so, they had to get through here somehow. And they got here, we think, by about 50,000 years ago. And now the problem with that is the near Great Skull is older than 42,000, maybe 45,000. But on the face of it, people arrived in Australia before they got to Island Southeast Asia, which is a little bit of a conundrum. And uh, at least people managed to whiz through Southeast Asia and into Australia very rapidly. So, there's our second question. How did people get through, or, or what was it, well, let's, let's rephrase it in terms of both animals and plants and humans. How do you, what processes assembled uh, the set of environments that have occurred on Sunderland now, we're going to focus on this area here that produced the abundant biodiversity we see today and produced the environments that people had to work with and navigate to get, well, settle this part of the world and move on into Australia. It's been known for an awful long time that if you looked on the Sunder shelf, this is here, Dr. Mollengraf in 1921, he noticed that there were a set of rivers on the mainland and you could actually trace these in the bathymetry offshore out into the Java Sea, out onto the Sunda Shelf, all the way down from what's now presumably the Chao Praia into the South China Sea. And obviously the obvious implication from that is that this was once land. Now this is old hat today. We know that for the last two million years, the, the Quaternary period, we've had this cycling of climate between warm and cold, between ice ages and interglacial periods. You've all seen the movie Ice Age probably. And one of the things that happened during this time was that sea level dropped by about 120 meters or cycled by about 120 meters up and down as, ice, as water was uh, taken out of the oceans and stored in the ice caps, sea level dropped, exposing this continent of Sunderland. And this really is the, uh, a huge area, it's about the size of, of Europe, and it really has undergone these massive changes, the largest of any tropical area in the world, between, going between the last glacial maximum or the ice age to, to the modern environment. I just put this in context, if I was uh, Mr. Raffles, I would have a very long walk if I wanted to settle <laughs> Singapore 18,000 years ago. And I'm not sure I would have started to, wanted to start a port at that time. 